Can't hear me. Okay, good. So, 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 <clears throat> today we are going to talk about Plethon, the Byzantine philosopher, mystic, dare we say. Uh, I suppose he had political ideas as well. What would you call him? What would you call him? Just philosopher? Um, I think revolutionary for sure near the end of his life. But um, yeah, definitely philosopher. Um, I think he's probably the main reason why we moved away from uh, Aristotle in that time period was because he uh, came back and you know brought Plato into a higher light. So I think he was definitely a revolutionary, but in a philosophical way, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Revolutionary thinker, um, somehow darling of the elites, <laughs> even though, you know, from all other accounts you hear of that period, you'd think he would have been, you know, uh, burnt at the stake or something, but he got away with it. Um, so yeah, we're well, well, just going to run down an account of his life, I guess, a little bit for people that maybe don't know about him and for for ourselves to think about him and talk about him because he's more important than he than was considered historically for a while. But he's come back into favor a little bit as this eccentric character and obviously a great mind. I mean, he's he has a great mind. Uh, his greatest work is actually lost, but we have summaries of it by him. And by the guy who burned it. <laughs> no, not by him. Oh, yeah. No, a, a, a summary by him that his student saved or something like that. So we have these summaries. But he was a Platonist uh, and a pagan in the uh, during the Renaissance. And his he died actually right around the fall of Constantinople. No one knows if he was alive for that or not. But that's that was his era. And he was Greek. Um, so, yeah. Why don't you... Uh, do you want to say anything about him? Talk about him historically a little bit? Uh, that's just my quick rundown. But... Okay, so definitely some of the more interesting aspects of Plethon was uh, definitely during, you know, the Renaissance and, you know, uh, the Byzantine era. Uh, it was very dangerous to be pagan, but um, Plethon had a lot of respect from Christians and basically everyone alike during that time. And it's uh, mm -hmm. a definitely important note to make, too, that uh, Plethon, not only was he incorporating, you know, Platonism and paganism, but on top of that, he actually had a very uh, big interest into uh, Zoroastrianism. And yeah. Um, yeah. you can kind of see this a little bit in his uh, in his work, uh, what we have left of the Book of Laws anyway, which was, uh, again, perceived to be burnt. But uh, they uh, kept a little bit of it because they wanted to try him with the crime of paganism. Um, you can kind of see this in a little bit where you see some things that Zeus, I guess, wasn't very noted for. Like um, some of the hymns and everything, uh, as he calls as Zeus fatherless, even though with the Greeks, you know, it was definitely Kronos. Um, so there was definitely a lot of interesting syncretism going on. But all in all, I mean, Plethon was a very interesting guy um, in a time where, you know, pagans were far and few in between. You know, a very respected man rose up and said, hey, paganism's back. There's nothing you can do about it. And then they proceeded to send him away. And yeah. So, well, they did but i mean he got away with a lot you know i i feel like he you know he had the respect of a lot of the elites i believe even um was it was it the pope at the time or someone like that said they believed that his soul was not in his body and he meant this as a compliment because he worked towards um healing the schism in the church he wanted the east and west to combine you know and he was very concerned with the ottoman invasion the way that he was marketing paganism too or at least with his beliefs was he actually wasn't trying to create an entire state of uh, hellenism for whatever reason i think he viewed it more as like a more scholarly you know religion as far as that goes but uh he was pretty uh pretty tolerant i guess you could say except for the portions where you know he um uh, condemned homosexuals to be burned at the stake and um you know other things of that nature uh, and a lot of what he wrote about as far as uh, you know, civilization and how things should be made up, he actually took from Plato's Republic. And I think that definitely yeah. uh, uh, scored him big, you know, with a lot of the elites and uh, the Byzantines for the time. Yeah, and he was actually, he was educated, part of his education was in, part was in, in Constantinople and the other one was in, what's that city? Oh, I don't, I wonder if I have it here. Was it like something like, I forget the name of it, but it was actually in the Ottoman Empire. It was he, there was a scholarly city uh, based on some 
uh, caliphate model, which he also studied. He studied there as well. I guess he was free to go back and forth somehow, whatever. Mm -hmm. But he uh, he was the first to really reject what the incredibly popular Aristotelian Aristotelianism. How do you say it? Aristotelianism. I would say Aristotle and yeah, <laughs> Aristotelian, I guess, um, yeah. attitude, attitude of the time, which he, he was everything and Plato was just forgotten. And he actually, I believe, he used Plotinus and other works directly to Cosimo de' Medici. So he was like directly responsible for really, you know, a, a good, healthy portion of the Renaissance in total in many ways, like not just Plot Plotinus, but other, other um, Platonic thinkers as well. So that was really quite something, uh, quite notable. And yeah, he had this uh, amazing story of his great masterwork, which was, um, it was he, he, was it he died? It was, he didn't publish it or something and then he died and then uh, Theodora had it. In fact, uh, the Scholarius guy who burned it, believe it or not, was actually Plethon's student. Um, him and uh, Plethon were actually very good, you know, friends as far as that goes and uh, Plethon was, very much like a mentor to Scholarius, but um, whenever Scholarius, being him being a diehard you know Christian, whenever he received the Book of Laws, um, he burnt two thirds of it, and the last remaining one third was actually copied by uh, Plethon students. It wasn't. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't actually until the other day I figured that out because it was uh, Opsipos who released the translation of Book of Laws. And I had the nerve to email him and say, hey, where in the world did you get this? Because everybody thought this was burnt. And that's when he told me one third remained that was copied by Plethon students. And yeah. it was uh, uh, translated from Latin into Italian by a man by the name of uh, Alexandre or something in the uh, 1850s. And then he made a translation of it. Right. And uh, yeah, it's very, very excellent. Uh, the contents of it really bridges the gap between early Platonism and then late Platonism. And uh, yeah, it's, it's absolutely fantastic fantastic work and i can definitely see why they wanted to destroy it um and as far as uh <laughs> plethon goes you know as far as uh him being himself um i wouldn't say necessarily that he was trying to hide the fact that he was pagan throughout the time that he was because uh, i ran into an interesting oh, really? quote yeah for sure it was from one second here yeah george of tribbenzond who said that uh and i quote I myself heard him at Florence asserting that in a few more years, the whole world would accept one and the same religion with one mind, one intelligence, one teaching. And when I asked him Christ or Muhammad's, he said neither, but it will not differ that much from paganism. I was so shocked by these words that I hated him and I feared him like a poisonous viper and I could no longer bear to see or hear him. I heard too from a number of Greeks who escaped here from the Peloponnese that he openly said before he died, that not many years after his death, Muhammad and Christ would collapse and the truth would shine through every re region of the globe. And yeah. um, to me, I think that was uh, very reminiscent of the triumphant return of paganism, because, again, paganism is definitely on the uh, the rise. It's very uh, mm -hmm. a lot more popular than it was even just me from me being a kid when I first became a pagan to now. I mean, the numbers that are climbing are just astounding. Yeah, so you were all alone and feeling lonely, and now, now they're all around you. Now there's too many. But he yeah. was also a great. He was a Platonist as well. Like that was the. So he's. I mean, in terms of what we're in, interested in, he was really. But uh, just to complete that. Yeah, he was our guy. That's the word I'm looking for. Just to complete that story, like so. Yeah, Theodora had the copy of his book. She sent it to, uh, Genadius, who is also known as, um, as you said, Scholarius. Scholar is, yeah. Yep. And he he told her to, he told her to burn it and give it back to her. And then she had to flee when Constantinople fell. Constantinople fell. And she was like, I, I she refused to burn it because she thought such an important work by such an important man, she wouldn't do it. And she gave it back to him and then he then he burned it. <laughs> yeah. Which was unfortunate and everything. But at least we have the we have the bits of it that we do have. So mm -hmm. you can't uh, we're, we're we're very lucky that he was able to write anything at all in that period and get away with it. So like he was friends, he cozied up with elites and everything. And, and you were saying about his um some of his harsh things he wrote. I mean, what he said about the homosexuals was in a uh, letter he wrote um, to another elite. There's so many names and things I, I don't know. I don't know it off by heart, but because um, he wanted to turn <laughs> the Peloponnese into basically Plato's Republic, as far as I can see, 
and he had his own ideas about it. And he, he just said, why don't we just like uh, sort of close the borders there and, and uh, look inwards culturally there. And he had he wrote in this letter all the rules and laws as he as he would apply them. And he didn't he spoke about paganism. He didn't really. He said he didn't. He spoke loosely about God and what they should do. But it was very very much. He was like it was a it was a republic modeled after Platonism. Let's say where there was an aristocracy of um, extremely well read. Let's say philosopher kings that would run the place. And it was even he mentioned uh, having the the zealots again mm -hmm. or the helots. Sorry. Yeah, the uh, the and, Platonists you know, in general, yeah, are just uh, were very good at uh, hiding uh, their beliefs, you know, throughout history because it, it was a very simple manner of because uh, the original word for uh, God, you know, in Greek, you could say God and it referred to the entirety of divinity, but gods would re refer to specific aspects of divinity. So Platonists could easily, yeah. you know, blend in by just using the term God. And but as soon as they say gods, yeah. you know, I'm sure they had daggers pointed at their throats, but. As long as they just said God, hey, yeah. you know. Yeah. But so he, yeah, so he was he was outlining this idea for the Peloponnese, which was ignored, apparently. So we did, didn't have a good king or leader in charge there. He should have, like, taken him up on it. But, like, the harsh, there was a few wacky, harsh-sounding ideas, such as, uh, I think, burn homosexuals at the stake because they um, promote weakness or something or other. I don't remember what it was, but that was probably the harshest one. There was a few, like, really crazy. But, I mean, what a great... To just to be able to say, okay, let's take the state and let's mold it exactly as we want. Let's to have be it the type of person and the type of mind that would just have this idea. Let's turn this country into exactly what we want. This let's just take this section of the country of the land and like mm -hmm. recreate an archaic, <laughs> or not even not even recreate an archaic, but let's make it in Plato's vision or you know with elements of my own vision. Oh and yeah, to be that kind of person that would even suggest that, and then send a letter saying we should do this, and like you know, yeah or nay. The guy said the guy ignored him, but you know it could have gone that way. I mean, there's a there's quite a few things that Plethon had stated uh, as what he was in favor for that definitely would have gotten him uh, blackballed by modern uh, interpretations. Like, uh, for one, he believed putting homosexuals to death. And for two, he was actually a proponent of slavery. Um, he just wanted to regulate slavery. He didn't agree with punishing them with uh, mutilation. But at the same time, definitely, you know, using them and being kind to them. Hmm. Yeah. He proposed in that case for the helots just to be, I think he just called them working taxpayers, like he, the tax slaves was his, was his new version of the helots. Something to do with they paid through their taxes. They, they financed the, the, aristocratic, uh, the aristocratic and the military class, I believe mm -hmm. was his. But yeah, he, he definitely had all kinds of excellent wacky ideas. Excellent and wacky, let's say, before I get myself in trouble. But um, <laughs> he, uh, <laughs> he, in his uh, book of laws, so would you say then that he was the type? He was like trying to, in the way that Plotinus was almost as well, that sort of trying to. There's a word. There's a term for it that also escapes me right now. Of course, everything escapes me when I need it. Uh, but like where Zeus was really the prime, as you said, that he thought of Zeus as as not having a father. That Zeus was the, uh, the prime god and always was the prime god, sort of like supplanting. Yeah, right. That basically, they, they Zeus has always existed. You know, Jesus or. Just sort of like yeah. not Christianifying it, but yeah, but sort of making it more palatable to the Christian uh, religious ideas of the time. Do you think he was uh, of that thinking that way? Um, I don't. I, I think that actually came more from his Zoroastrian uh, kind of influences. Right. I guess you could say uh, that being okay. the demiurge, you know, being the the super the or not the supernatural, excuse me, but like the super beneficial being, you know, of all mankind that is concerned with the world. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. However, he didn't include the yeah. dualism of Zoroastrianism where, you know, there's naturally uh, an antagonist to the story. Um, yeah. But I, th I think that's probably where he got that. He was syncretizing uh, Zoroastrianism because the creator of Zoroastrianism, again, also bears that title of, you know, father of all always existed, the fatherless, the motherless, yada, yada. Um, has always uh, bared titles like this, you know, throughout life or through the uh, the method of religion. So it didn't yeah. really surprise me that he added that. I don't think it's uh, very relevant, I guess you could say, in the long run, because a lot of people will try to say he's trying to dumb down Hellenic religion with Zoroastrianism, but ancient people definitely had a different way of thinking about that. Well, every cult and every variation, you know, from the Orphic onward, is because some guy sort of had the balls to call himself a prophet and adopt things, adapt things in a certain way, let's say and to various levels of success or various levels of, let's say, true intuition or getting true 
inspiration from the gods or from you know the hidden world let's say divine inspiration mm -hmm. so he was attempting that maybe he did succeed in a way at least that we can view it and look back at it like that but i like i don't have i personally don't if you, you think he's, mud, he's muddling the waters of hellenism with zoroastrianism i think that's not it's a good thing to try in trying to, it, like he probably understood that you need to you need to ad adapt somewhat and like have new things in a way and the best way to do that is to maybe a certain level of syncretizing or meshing together the best of things that you're aware of <laughs> Like yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's a, that's the philosophical method, you know, at work is, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we can't have all of these creators of the universe and assume that they're different beings because that would, you know, that would create some kind of a, well, what belongs to who? You, questions like that. And in fact, yeah. um, I have a, uh, I have an address from him to Zeus in the uh, book okay. of the law here. It goes right. uh, along the concept of, and, and this just kind of gives you an idea because I'm sure that you've read the Orphic hymns or the Homeric hymns, and I'm sure that your uh, viewers probably have at least heard of them. So just to compare, yeah, this one is along the lines of uh, all these gods, legitimate or powerful children of King Zeus occupy Olympus. That is to say the summit of the super celestial region, the purest part of space. It is from there, according to their attributes, they govern under the direction of mutable nature, which can be created because it is not the, it is the product of a cause and is the object of creation. It is who marks the limit of their action or orders the greater of the whole. Actually, hang on one second. I'm stupid and I read the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice. That one was nice. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, with King Zeus, obviously, he's going to attribute attribute the uh, the twelve beings that came after him. But again, we see the, the see the words mentioned here: um, fatherless Zeus, motherless Zeus, uh, essentially subscribing to the fact that he has always existed, mm. with or without yeah. his parents. So yeah, it's it's rather interesting the way that he goes about describing this. Um, but still, nonetheless, I mean, it's it's absolutely uh, interesting, and I'm glad that the last part of that book made uh, or at least get, escaped the hellfires. So. Yeah, it reminds me of a, a quote I heard once, and I don't know. It was only ever I, I I tried to source it. I saw it online originally, and I tried to source it, and it was in in a book, um, something about the apocalypse. It's this is a long time ago now, but it claimed that there was graffiti found in a temple during the time of uh, Julian or shortly after, and it said it you know, like it was it was afterwards I think, but it was it went. Um, what did the graffiti say? It said there's only one God, and Julian was his prophet. So it just oh. <laughs> reminds me of that, it, that kind of way of thinking, which, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I, I don't have a problem with that, but it, you know, and not in the sense that there's no other gods at all, but in the sense that there's the important one that is sort of more all, all encompassing in the same way that I think, um, Platon would have liked to, uh, create a religion about which, cause he was in the business of creating or recreating religion or trying to anyways. And he, was doing a not bad job, and at the same time trying to unite the the, uh, the schism in the in the church, which was, you know, and talking openly about his thoughts and ideas while doing this with all these other elites, which was even more amazing. But uh, like most Platonists, he believed in reincarnation, which is uh, interesting and good. Uh, like I believe we believe, mm -hmm. and he. He believed the universe has no beginning or no to end or end in time. So this is very uh, platonic and that was created perfect. Nothing needed to be added to it. And man as relative of the gods should strive towards good, which is also very platonic, which is really virtue. Yeah, for sure. And uh, he, he actually touches on some subjects that uh, I often quote him to pagans because um, they, uh, of course, with pagans, where we read from the myths and such, we see the idea of uh, divine punishment, you know, where the gods are going to punish mankind for certain deeds. In fact, uh, I'm pretty sure it was Zeus who said that um, for shame, how the mortals place blame on us gods for their ills and woes, but it is they through their own recklessness and abandonment when sorrow beyond what is given. Um, Platon actually goes into this a little bit, and this is an important thing for pagans to remember is that the gods are holy beneficial benevolent and then of course this is the part where some will come to me and say well why would they punish people well the idea and this is where plethon is quoted at 
is that the gods themselves, whenever they correct mankind, they do it for the purpose of perfection. And when sweeter coercions are not affecting them anymore, they employ harsher ones to get them back on the correct track. And this can actually include all the way up to death. You know, I mean, if a person does something so terrible, yeah, I, I personally believe an entire reset would probably be necessary, you know, for the benefit of this person to be flung back out into the uh, incarnative cycle. And uh, so that's, that's just one of the things that, you know, Plethon touches on that it kind of is a gray area within paganism where people are wondering how you can have punishment and benevolent gods at the same time. I didn't know. Even though people were talking, it would seem to be quite obvious there must be some kind of punishment and wrath. And there's a lot of stories about like Bellerophon and others where it's really quite obvious that you don't mess around and you don't show disrespect. And uh, uh, I would have thought that sounds more like the, you know, it sounds a bit sounds a bit modern to me. <laughs> the idea mm -hmm. that there's no 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 wrath, no well, no I don't. I don't think so much that they, they didn't believe in like punishment and stuff. I think it's more along the lines of a lot of people actually hate uh, philosophical ideas like Platonism. You'll see that in a lot of like hard polytheists who uh, like anything after the, like the traditional, you know, things that were written about the religion, they don't accept anything after that. And uh, they're like, well, how can you believe in benevolent gods? And that, that's just kind of the voice that I imagine them narrating as. And, uh, yeah, that that's kind of like the uh, the justif justification behind it is that the gods punish for the purpose of uh, perfecting mankind, and not so much that they like to punish or anything, because that would be malevolent. So, yeah, I mean, my from personally, I have a feeling more like they, not that they're indifferent to us, but there's, the, uh, my personal feeling, which I you know you don't have to agree with me, is that they. They're a little bit indifferent to us in con consequentially in their actions or in the energies they unleash and so forth. Um, you know, we can go our own way and do some of that. And our own decision making is very important, but you know, obviously there's terrible things that happen in the world to innocent people. And it's not like um, I mean, events in the world, if you view them properly, I think platonically and stoically, then anything that happens is sort of you have to take as, you know, as Marcus Aurelius would think, out of your hands anyways. And not be not get too worked up as the hows and whys. I mean, I do think that anything good or bad can happen to you in two miraculous degrees, personally. And whatever happens to you personally is all very. If you're thinking a lot of inwardly, selfishly, or with self pity, especially that really, I think it's mm. just it's just nothingness. You know, we don't don't be so concerned with yourself and look at the entire world and it's in its overall miracle and, and the things that happen. And in that aspect, incredibly I powerful mean, and in that aspect, I oh, you're good. Um, wait, there's that there's that delay there. So whenever I see you yeah. stop talking, yeah. I figure I have to say I'm sorry. But um, yeah, no problem. And, and no, in in that respect, I absolutely agree. I still believe that the gods, you know, are 100 beneficial to mankind. But at the same time, we have to remember that the sublunar is one of the lowest realms of creation. You know, the realm of material where people are governed by body, sensual passions, and things. You know, and they fall victim to anger, lust, uh, envy. All of these things that, you know, directly correlate to, you know, why we're stuck in this incarnative cycle in the first place. But yeah. as far as uh, that necessarily goes, uh, that's what I always tell people. You know, if you're incarnated here, then you're here for a reason. You know, you, you have to be showing some of these, you know, passions or things, because if you perfect yourself upon your death or even in the case of, say, Asclepius, you know, they get they get a, 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 I wouldn't say apotheosis because it was Asclepius who became a god. But it's uh, essentially, essentially you transcend. And um, mm -hmm. so we, we definitely have to play by the rules of the realm that we live in for the sake of our bodies. Um, we definitely have to, uh, you know, maintain order. We have to uh, keep our communities clean because this is what, you know, causes suffering is people who are not willing to take action against it. Uh, yeah. You know, for example, I, I always pray, you know, for protection to protect my home, uh, to protect me, you know, from bad people. But at the same time, I absolutely sleep with a gun beside my bed every night. Um, <laughs> I'm always ready to, you know, if I have to protect myself, I will. Because I realize that this is a part of living in the sublunar and that a person should be a master of that. They shouldn't be a victim of it just because they're religious. So, yeah, yeah. Yes, very good. No, I totally agree. So um, I just wanted to see. I, I did write. I did have a list here of 
um, the laws he he uh, not not the book of laws, but the the rules he devised for for turning the Peloponnese into his version of uh, Plato's Plato's Plato-esque Republic, which mm -hmm. was really his totally his own ideas. But like some of them are interesting. So he thought he could promote a, bene a benevolent monarchy as the most stable form of government, that the land should be shared rather than individually owned, uh, that there was strict divisions of sex and class, laborers should keep a third of their produce, and that soldiers should be professional. Um, and this is a weird one. I don't, I think he's just meaning public displays of affection. I'm not sure what he means. He, sa he says that uh, love should be private, um, not because it is shameful, but because it is sacred, hmm. which is great. Which is great. I'm assuming this. Do you think that's what he means? Uh, yeah, yeah, he, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, those were the main ones that I got, anyways. Apart from the uh, the uh, burning at the stake stuff. <clears throat> um, there was stuff about uh, he was he was interested in uh, securing the borders from the Ottomans, and, and uh, it was all written in the same letter, I think. But yeah, it's interesting. Um, what would you think then about that? His idea of the ideal, Platon's Republic. I mean, again, it, it's one of those things. Uh, I think in the world that we live in now, that's just not an option without the right people. I think. Uh, I think when people start adopting uh, spirituality again, I think it that something like that could possibly happen. But uh, yeah. where we kind of live in like the consumerist atheist thing that we you know we we, we put up with today it's a, ma a major reform, you know, would have to happen. This might've been possible back in his day when people were still, you know, devoutly religious. But, um, nowadays it's, uh, it's definitely a, a hopeful thought, you know, that we, would, you, you, if we were, if we were millionaires or something, you could like buy, buy a, buy an Island off Africa or something and maybe, maybe do some of it. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you come nowadays. If like, you know, we're not millionaires and we're not going to be brother. So, uh, that's not going to happen. But, you know, as everything breaks down, it's good to evaluate things as he did, uh, both philosophically and politically, and to, you know, surmise what kind of ideal uh, situation you could bring about. I mean, that was just a letter he wrote, and like, you know, <laughs> seriously proposing, let's just do this. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe have it taken seriously. I guess he was enough of an elite at that point that he might have been taken seriously. But, um, yeah, uh, that's... Uh, a lot that's his writing on that anyway so we covered that and i guess there's not that much like apart from the history of him and his teaching he has sort of a teaching career and a sort of quasi-political career i think he was sent to live in the peloponnese um from uh, from constantinople by someone in charge was he like you were you saying he felt he was banished there i didn't read that he was like put up sent away because he was a troublemaker is that is that your understanding uh, I, th I think that's the way that I read it personally. I could be wrong, but um, I definitely read that he re he re he got some type of backlash for something. I'm not sure necessarily if he was like sent away for that purpose, but he definitely. I don't think he died within the walls of Constantinople, did he? Wasn't he somewhere else when this happened? Yeah, no, he lived the rest of his life there in. Uh, okay. In, yeah. In okay. The former Sparta. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. yeah, and then uh, if I recall correctly, too, they uh, his students later exhumed his body and returned him yeah. to a, a certain place. Yeah, they buried him in the uh, a place for free men or something. They said uh, a graveyard for free men or something. Yeah, I'm not sure what it was, but yeah. So that was good. I mean, he was respected. His students, except for the one student who was burned his book, is mortal enemy. But it's mm -hmm. it's a good dramatic story. Got it. Would make a great little. Uh, I mean, perhaps someone has already written a sort of uh, novel about it or something. A true now, one of these true stories. Well, we, we, we couldn't have this conversation either about Plethon because uh, one thing that I absolutely love about him is that uh, just the amount of work that he went into of absolutely owning Aristotle's, you know, followers. I absolutely <laughs> well, love that. I, I haven't read that. Oh, uh, yeah. So you read that, yeah? Pe people actually wrote uh, stuff against him for, um, for uh, criticizing Aristotle's uh, philosophy. Um, right. I forgot what the actual texts are. In fact, actually, I might because I have a little note compilation here. I might have okay. to, I might have to find it later. But um, for sure, uh, one one thing that Aristotle absolutely hated was the idea of uh, Epicureanism, 
and the idea of like uh, like monks and stuff because they contribute absolutely nothing. Um, you know, they're they're not there when the enemies are at the gates. Uh, they're not there, you know, reproducing or you know helping civilization very much. You know, besides hanging out all day and you know recording certain texts. But then again, you know, the same people could record texts and not have to be a monk. So yeah. he 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 dismisses them as extremely lazy and indulgent people. Um, and I'm pretty sure he actually uh, he he compared modern day monks and Epicureans to being at that same level. Oh yeah, here we go. Um, Plethon argued that he attributed this same pleasure seeking to monks, who he accused of laziness. So, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Yeah, although he did get his copy mm -hmm. of Plotinus from a monk. I know that one of the one of the from a monastery, and he then he gave that to Cosimo. And it's really because it's really that that I mean, Cosimo was the guy who really spurned that Renaissance, which we so admire now, and all those guys, like all the artists, like Da Vinci. All the rest of them, they started doing paintings of pagan themes as well as Christian. They had their patrons. Um, not all of them did, actually. I don't know. Michelangelo didn't really do pagan themes, did he? he? He was strictly Christian. Maybe he was a true believer, or maybe maybe he didn't. I just can't remember. But uh, mm -hmm. most of them did sort of begin to get into that. You could see it. You'd see their private love of it, and then they'd have to do their, you know, Madonna and Child countless times over as well. But. Um, <laughs> So it was really Cosimo was responsible, and Cosimo was directly very much influenced by Plethon, who no one really talks about. I guess. I guess. I guess to this day, if they're, if you're a staunch Christian, you don't want, really want to talk about him, because he was, <laughs> you know, he was the Zeus man. Yeah, he was. He he was something else, man. And I actually just found that thing I was telling you about, um, where uh, in response to uh, Gennadius's defense of Aristotle, who he wrote in the during the timeline of Plethon when he was again owning Aristotelians, um, he argued against them in his uh, book. It's just uh, labeled "Reply" that Plato's God was more consistent with Christian doctrine than Aristotle. So I think he was like playing two courts at the same time. I think that maybe he was trying to get Christians, you know, more into the idea of Platonism and then give them the. Uh, the razzle dazzle, so to speak, and uh, eventually it'd be swapped out for Zeus and you know whatever the Hellenic religion would prescribe. Yeah, hmm. yeah, and you have to admit, like the bravery of him, really, to just go full full throttle and all this. Because at that time, you could go out in the street and see witches being burned and so forth. Like it, you know, it was uh, he, he had great courage <laughs> to just you know he he got a hold of Plato and the others, and he was like, okay, that's it. This is mm -hmm. it. At a, time like, at a time like that, like knowing what we know now, it's easier for us than it would have been at his time to see. I guess he saw that he saw it written on the page, and it just so illuminated him. He saw the light through the darkness, and that was it. But I just admire his courage and his uniqueness as a character, as uh, I think we all do. The, um, an another thing to bring up too about Plethon in regards to the Book of Laws, because again, I I've been reading a lot of this lately. Uh, one big important part that he goes into is uh, regarding fate, you know, for people, because there were people at the time who believed in a 100% indispensable faith that it was going to occur no matter what you did. And in his opinion, that attributed to laziness. But at the same time, he didn't believe that fate didn't exist because that would incur the idea that uh, the universe wasn't intelligent in that sense. And that creation had absolutely no purpose for it. Um, his kind of idea to nurture the two of them, is that the gods uh, with, with the creation and determine the fate of something, um, it's almost, it, it can almost make splits in that sense. That the idea of, um, you know, certain paths, you know, that we could follow or that certain things, or almost in like the hermetic ideal that uh, there are predestined events, but how much we take part in them are completely up to us. So right. that, that's kind of like just another, I guess, microscope into his mind in regards to, uh, you know, really, really uh, making a big impact into Platonism or late Platonism and really bridging the gap between early paganism, which is, again, extremely important. Um, yeah. Yeah. All, all in all, very, very interesting guy. Um, you know, he was very quick to, you know, dismiss uh, people who came against uh, mostly the Aristotelians, but also uh, just to kind of uh, further paganism that was, uh, again, lacking up into that point i'm pretty sure he was probably one of the only pagans in his time that just came out and announced hey we're back so <laughs> yeah i mean he was for sure so what's your view on Ar aristotle overall let me, let me ask um yourself personally. 
Well, I mean, I would I would compare Aristotle to uh, his uh, well, his student, you know, uh, Alexander. Alexander was the direct, um, you know, manifestation essentially of Aristotle. He learned under him, went for him for counsel. Um, and uh, as we know, Alexander was not exactly that great of a person. Um, he was very indulgent from what I've read of him. Uh, and then you, of course, have the uh, issue of uh, charges of pedestry. And all these other really, really weird practices that they were engaging in. Uh, Aristotleanism, or just Aristotle to me in general, I think is a little bit too materialist. I think it, I think it is essentially wearing blinders in the face of actual true divinity. Because um, again, it was Aristotle who you know was promoting the senses that we must mm -hmm. be able to have intelligible things for us to understand. But thought definitely transcends any of the senses that we possess. So I have to draw the line with Aristotle. He has some good yeah. stuff. You know, a broken yeah, clock is a broken clock is right twice a day. Still. Um, I'm not saying that Aristotle was completely useless, but at the same time, I think that uh, in the long run, I think he done more harm to a civilization than if people were just to, to accept uh, Platonism, you know, over that and focus on the transcendental, portions and not the the eminent that is you know already here and that you can uh understand through the senses right yeah i wouldn't be like i from i read his ethics and a few other things and i didn't get take come away from it what a lot of people have like he certainly said some anti-plato kind of things but overall i mean he was a platonist he studied as a platonist he you know he he, he had his own take on things but i never saw it as so much as a counter to the other myself and i would say i have to say myself i do i do like alexander i like everything he, well not everything he did <laughs> mm -hmm. i like a lot of what he did i'm into that promethean you know the way he just i guess conquered the world yeah <laughs> yeah that, that, that portion he, is he went, all, he went to all these parts of the world and then all the places he went had then a library and a gymnasium with you know uh of the gods sculptures of the gods everywhere they just sound like like it was great in its way so I can see what you mean. There's negative. Everything has its good and good and bad yeah. parts as well. I, I didn't but like I, the personal Alexander, but I definitely like the historical Alexander. Yeah, I'll put it that way. Good. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that, that's a good way to say it. All right, for sure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I didn't. I didn't take from whatever. I maybe I'm sure there's Aristotle. I have to get to read that really explains why he's so anti-Plato. But like, I don't have a problem admiring both. I like Plato a lot more, and I didn't take it. Same same when I hear people who read Plato and come back with these takes. Uh, and interpretations of him as always, oh, he's, he's like a feminist communist and all this kind of thing. Like, it's like, is that, did we read the same book? Like, I mean, I know he says, yeah, few, really. He says kind of weird things here and there, but like, you know, that's not really even important at all. Oh my gosh. Um, yeah. But, um, <laughs> you know, these people, yeah. And they're, they're like, no, this is exactly what he said. And I don't know. But it, I actually don't even fully, why do you think, why did the Christians and Islam latch on to Aristotle so much? What was it they liked about Aristotle exactly? You think? Well, like, because Plato was very rational. I've uh, I think I've addressed this in earlier uh, videos with you that I think uh, Christians are definitely uh, more of a religion of death and they're, they're extremely uh, down to earth people, I guess you could say. I think uh, Aristotleanism is, uh, you know, very down to earth, uh, more focused on, you know, uh, what happens in regards to uh, the senses and things. Mm -hmm. And uh, Christianity, uh, you know, for what it was worth, you know, did provide a sense of stability, but at the same time, it denied people you know, the say like the beauty of the body. This is why there is a lack of, you know, art um, and, and denied, you know, certain uh, very uh, passionate things, not not bad passions, but, you know, just the absolute expression and the liberty of the, you know, mankind's soul. I think it denied this. And at the same time with Aristotle, I think it, a modern equivalent of Aristotle would be more of like consumerism, just uh, busy idiotism. Um but with uh, Plato, wow. definitely more of a transcendent aspect. And uh, I was uh, happy to see that uh, Hermes Trismegistus was the one who uh, added a very uh, syncretic form of Platonism. And it just yeah. absolutely rounded it out. So definitely, I think Plato eternally dabs on Aristotle 100%. Yeah, for sure. But I, I still don't. I'm, did we talk about that before? I don't even remember. But like, I just don't quite understand why they. Like, what. what is it just because of the Plato's sort of ideas of reincarnation and the specific religious ideas that, that Aristotle was more just writing about virtue and um, thing? I guess it could be, 
how, how did it graft itself onto other religions? Not not that they didn't also graft Platonism. So I mean, they stole everything and mashed it all together, anyways. But I just know, like you say, like in the time of Platon, Aristotle was the man, and he was the one who brought Plato back into the spotlight. So mm -hmm. um, maybe it's hard to say exactly exactly I why. Think, it doesn't make sense to me exactly. I, I think Aristotle, especially, was um, popular just for the the general idea that. Um, well, for for one, his followers, uh, it, it, it definitely got more spread through like people like you know Alexander, and then you know the future uh, Aristotelians who were actually going out, and then Plato. You know, you had people in the academy, but then then again, you know, you still you still had people like Hypatia who were still you know highly admired, you know, as Platonists. Yeah. Yeah. But um, I, I think yeah. Aristotle uh, really appealed to more less spiritual people because again it was more focused on the senses rather than you know the transcendent aspect of the soul like thought and consciousness um okay. I, I would i would say that his philosophy is more bite-sized and easier to understand because I'll, I'll be honest plato has given me a headache quite a few times and <laughs> i i've really had to yeah. sit down and like I, i've even gotten out paper before and have taken notes and have tried to reference it to certain things and eventually it does come to me but i think it is uh i think it's like the uh the hard mode of uh, philosophy to yeah, understand yeah. some of the stuff. Right, 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 right. Right. Okay. Well, that could be it. Yeah. So after um, Plethon, who was the next big pagan figure in, uh, in our history? Well, let's take a look here because Plethon passed away. And I think, uh, yeah, uh, well, depending on who you listen to 1452 or 1454, right. um, Sure, there was a pagan presence in the 15th century, or not not as much for sure. Yeah, but um, let me see here. So he was the last one to get away with it for a long time, probably. Yeah, well, the the Crusades, uh, there, there were still, I mean, there were still pagan communities. I'm pretty sure the Baltics held out for quite a while against uh Christianity up until like I think like the 16th century, if I remember right. But the yeah. uh, the Northern Crusades is really like what sparked after that, and again, um, I think that once the uh, Eastern Ro Roman Empire fell, that it created that enormous power vacuum, and people were rushing, you know, to create these massive amounts of smaller kingdoms. Um, yeah. And I don't think I, I think there definitely was a bigger pagan presence back then in the day. It just wasn't very written about because even like during the time of Theodosius. In the Western Roman Empire, where uh, he had outlawed paganism and made it punishable by death, he was still writing, and uh, I just essentially call it uh, very well written bitching about uh, pagans being secretive. And he discovered that some of like the senators and all this other stuff were actually pagan, and they were just pretending not to be. And yeah. uh, this thoroughly angered him. So definitely a pagan underground movement there for a long time. But uh, I there think a at, there was a pope at one point who was like all. Oh, about Hellenism, and he even referred to himself as Hercules or something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. it was it. Uh, was it Honorinius or something? I can't. I can't yeah, remember. I, remember. I don't remember, but he de he definitely he was the Pope, and he he probably was inside. I'm I'm sure he was. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and he got away with that too. Like, I I love these bombastic figures. They get away with this crazy shit. I just love it. Yeah, they're they're, they're <laughs> something else, man. They just uh, they just decided one day they just don't care anymore. And they're like, yeah. hey, the Pope. Imagine the Pope nowadays. I'm Hercules. Yeah. <laughs> Just whatever that those times were different yeah they were yeah well those times might, i think those times are coming back even talking about things breaking up into small you know i think all those times we will be seeing those times again one oh, thing one, yeah. last, one last thing i wanted to say about plethon uh that i the snippet that i read of him which i think is interesting is that he thought that the divine order and this is an interesting way of thinking about it um governed the organization of things like bees and ants and that it was and the dexterity of spiders, he said, and the growth of plants, magnetic attraction, and the amalgamation of mercury and gold, which is very, it's kind of hermetic. Yeah. But just the, the idea that it governs the behavior of bees and ants, so in, in, it's true in, the, in that way they do things in a collective uh, way. They're what we just call instinct, mm -hmm. which, you know, again, platonically, you think is more like your, your daemon or your, your genius. Anyways, which is like another force speaking to you, which is also the platonic idea, which Platon would have believed that you aren't actually learning in your life so much as you are being reminded what you already knew. So everything's kind of there in the back of your mind already and you carry on with in action wise, 
and us discussing it or philosophizing about it is just us kind of reminding ourselves or even being taught by a tutor. You're still only reminding yourself, which is interesting. What do you think of that? Yeah, for sure. I think there's a collective consciousness of the universe that we uh, tap into, to say the least. Um, definitely not as much as uh, we should be doing. That's why I always recommend people the practice of uh, meditation and such. I think it helps kind of uh, zone in on that. But uh, definitely, Plethon 100% believed in the idea of exter external forces working on the on the world. Uh, he was very big into the uh, astrological bodies. Um, he was very big into the idea of sublunar gods who were directly, you know, uh, interacting with creation. And um, mm -hmm. and then again, we, we, we go back to the Plotinus aspect because we can't mention that without, you know, the terrible things that happen in the universe, um, not being of the gods, but rather it's uh, essentially like the natural order of things. And it's our, I think Plotinus uh, compared us to a turtle that uh, a turtle in the middle of a bunch of dancers. And if we move in the correct directions at the same exact time, we won't get squished by the dancers. And instead we will join in on the dance. But if we try to go away from that dance, we will be squashed. So 100% for the body, we need to be attuned to the sublunar. We need to know what is healthy for us, what is protective for us, what is you know the least amount of risk for the greatest reward. And at the same time, we need to be training our mind too. Because uh, yeah. I think the last thing any of us want to do is like die an early death and then get through and through the reincarnation cycle once again and have to repeat this process. So yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, for my own part, I can say like personally in my life, when I learned, I always had a good instinct. I mean, we all do. I should say when I learned to trust or and obey my own, my own instinct above all, I just was much better off in every possible way. And I have been ever since. And I pay close attention to it now. Don't be too influenced by your social concerns and, and things like this. Like, I mean, you have to, to a certain degree, but listen to your instinct at instinct, as we call it, you should call it. Mm -hmm. Or um, yeah, that's what I always call. It. I refer to it as is simply the daemon. Um, that's so, that's so upsetting for the Christians, though. To <laughs> if you're trying yeah. to do, if we're trying to go door to door and sell ourselves, have you heard about our Lord and Savior, Plethon, or whatever? <laughs> yeah. yeah, get the uh, get that uh, nice mural of him in shirt form and go around. Yeah, yeah, like Mormons or whatever. Have you heard yeah. <laughs> me yeah. with this gear on? Probably. Yeah, I don't but, know if no. uh, have you ever read into. Mormonism? Have I read into it? I've read about like the crazy uh, Joseph Smith and the tablets of gold and the aliens. Yeah, and yeah, that's what I'm talking about, man. Their beliefs are out there, and I'm honestly surprised that Christians put up with them like as much as they did back in the day. Well, they're thriving. They've, they've, they're like the only one of the few uh, groups that have the healthy birth rates and all that. I believe still aren't they? I don't know. Yeah, um, uh, they're very big on the idea because they're polygamous. You know, they believe that they can, you know, take more than one wife. So therefore, of course, they're going to have like a their own little baby booms. But uh, another yeah. thing that another practice that they do that I find weird is that they uh, convert their ancestors to Mormonism through like elaborate. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really well, weird stuff, man. Yeah, I don't I don't like it. But actually, uh, if you ever have been to Ancestry.com, um, the uh, Mormon Church is actually in control of one of the biggest genealogical records in the entire world like they have collected church documents from thousands of years ago and it's uh kept in a, a temperature controlled environment within uh within a mountain okay. and uh okay. really? it's, it, it's wow. crazy man they're like i don't know i feel like i feel like i feel like alistair crowley would have created that religion in a sense yeah i mean <laughs> I, I i can admire uh parts of the elements of that i can admire um i do like that they're cultish and um like i say i, I think this is like plethon tried and maybe they had some more success with, although he's, his, he's got a, and we inherit from him what his ideas and maybe you can say he'll have a larger success in the long run. But the idea that you have to change a little bit and you have to adopt a new cult with some slightly skewy views, like Platon tried to incorporate Zoroastrianism, you know, the Mormons just <laughs> took Christianity and added aliens and, you know, a lot of crazy things successfully. Yeah uh in, in the newness there is the energy though in that slight alter like how many times did christianity change and schism and, and alter and that's what's that's part of its strength you know that the fact that they could do that yeah they could evolve well, yeah just exactly. like, just like that. or like you're doing with your with the temple let's say you're not doing something exactly the same as it was before it's it's a new thing you're you've got the hermetic influence and everything you're combining things mm -hmm. yeah essentially not, not, hermeticism and platonism you know all in one and i always tell people you know if you're not comfortable uh you know adopting you know a, a certain aspect of religion because we we use religion more as like a vehicle than an actual uh, 
what would you call it? Like a, like it ends almost like a, the entire yeah. idea is that we're trying to establish contact with the divine and live in accordance with their laws and their virtues. So yeah. in that sense, you know, we should, we should take to heart whatever we consider to be inspirational and what, you know, truly uh, tickles the old mouse. But um, as far as um, in, in the sense of, you know, adopting things that you're not necessarily comfortable with or whatever, no, you, you don't need to do that, but just understand that, uh, D divinity definitely has quite a few spokes on the same wheel. And um, obviously some things are going to be more inspirational to us than others, but that doesn't necessarily make the other one wrong. It's just unpalatable to us in that sense. And yeah. that could be because of, you know, ethnicity, race, yada, yada. It just depends on what your beliefs are, you know, in, in terms of that. But um, a lot of it, I think has to do with our, uh, our birth religion, us coming up from a certain religion um, yeah. and, uh, we will naturally search for things that have made me from that. And that's of course why I was drawn to Platonism because there's a lot of Platonism in Christianity. Yeah. So, and everything else. Yeah. Yeah. He influenced, he, he already influenced everything and seeded everything all around. Alexander did a big job there as well. But then even then we have some older mutual roots as well, which maybe he was tapping into. I mean, they had, they had other knowledge. They had, they were closer to the further, further antiquity <clears throat> than we are since. And if maybe, you know, Christians and others hadn't burned so many books and we, we could have a bit better record of exactly what that was. But anyways, the, the main thing like in the, in the changing, the morphing nature of religion and what you're doing and what Mormons are doing or anybody is the certain, there is a certain core, almost impossible to explain truth uh, and value system. Well, no, the values can change, but like there's a truth uh, and a need to let's say show show reverence to the miracle or look back and think not look inward and look outward and to really have an appreciation not appreciation what's the word i'm looking for not appreciation not reverence well, i can't think of it anyways but there's there's a core truth anyways to all, running through all of them let's say and the other mm -hmm. things can be mutable to certain degrees and you can fail or succeed at muting them depending on what you choose to do <laughs> But um, yeah, the, the other thing I find that's very interesting is I find there's strength in dichotomy, which is weird, or in paradox. Like, let's say, like, look how popular Christianity became in Europe, even though it was based on foreign, a basic foreign uh, religion. You know, that's weird, and you wouldn't think that would be the case, but yet the weirdness of that kind of gave it a strength. Same, you know, same with weird, something weird like Mormonism or, or things that sound contradictory or crazy even can give it a strength <laughs> I, I don't, sure I, it's weird it's another thing that's hard to explain but anyways it's yeah I, I think the purity aspect of christianity is uh definitely well i mean pagan in origin obviously we've always believed in the idea of uh, you know purity but um the purity aspect of christianity too and one thing that was big with them was uh the uh the case of uh baptizing because mm -hmm. no matter you know how horrible of a person you were before you're born again and uh, that's why uh, that's why I honestly think that uh, Constantine really loved the idea of Christianity was because he had done some pretty terrible things. If I recall, didn't he like boil his kids alive or something of that something nature? Like that. But yeah. I thought he did some of that after he was baptized somewhere as well. No, I could it, be could, it could it very well could be. But um, yeah, you just uh, it, it opened the door for a lot of people, especially Christianity was especially popular among. Uh, women who couldn't bear children and slaves. So I, yeah. again, I, I think that they incorporated a lot of people into it. Um, and uh, they definitely put the entire uh, religions at the time, you know, on their head by doing this. And yeah. Yeah. they had nothing to lose in that sense. The Catholic church had a lot of synchronization with paganism with the, in the form of holidays and everything else. And uh, of course, Plato, they couldn't justify the Trinity without him because that would make them polytheists. So it <laughs> right. was, it was just a, it was like the perfect storm at the perfect time. And, uh, Romans were already incredibly indulgent at the time and probably just really didn't care too much. So yeah. it is what it is. But, um, yeah, yeah. I, I would agree with you. There is that like certain, that certain spark of it that was interesting to people. Yeah. There's things about it, I guess. I mean, there's lots, there's unique and weird things about it. But it's like, yeah, just the weirdness. It has to be weird. There has to be something weird that sounds incongruous. Mm -hmm. That's all I can say. Don't ask me how. It's one. Of, this is my instinct telling me. I can't yeah. explain it. 
Yeah, and but, uh, I mean, early Christians, I mean, they were spooky. If you ever read about them, like uh, praying in tombs and receiving visions and stuff like that's <laughs> that's spooky. And uh, yeah, I, I just find it interesting how far that faith has come and likewise how far paganism has come. And uh, yeah, or the I let you the old Nag Hammadi um, scrolls that they found with the old some of the, um, the the accounts of Jesus doing really weird things like, uh, you know, kill, randomly killing people, zapping them and like dr drying them up or something. <laughs> Well, the, the original stories were like quite a bit different the way they kind of see that's another point where they changed where they when they actually put the bible together they kind of made a new thing right there yeah they were like hmm, maybe not, it, maybe not that, that, yeah. I don't what we're saying but it wasn't it he seemed to be much more of a um not vengeful well sort of like he wasn't just all like love and innocence anyways he was like actively killing people that you know disobeyed him or something mm -hmm. In those in those weird scrolls but uh yeah we're a bit off the topic of plethon i guess but i think we we we, we said all we can say we're not we're not scholars on the topic and yep, plethonians, yeah. yeah yeah so <laughs> that's a little rundown of him plus some other stuff i guess so anything else you want to say bon no Summer? not not really he was uh you know very awesome guy uh absolutely love book of the laws uh you can find that on opsipos.com if anybody wants to Read the translation or just Google Opsipos and then Book of Laws. How do you spell um, that? Opsipos. Oh, Opsipos. O P S O. Oh, wait. Um, Opsipos. So O P S O P A U S. Yeah. Opsipos. Okay. Yeah. Opsipos, Opsipos. Book of Laws. And uh, yep, his translation pops up. Now he's actually going to be adding some more soon. Um, I, and that email that I sent to him wondering where in the heck he got this text. Um, he also mentioned to me that there has been 23 pages that have not been converted to English yet that he intends on doing. So, oh my God. um, yeah, so it's gonna, it's gonna be pretty big. I'm, I'm really curious to see what else is uh, in that. Yeah, for sure. Oh, I'd like, that's gold. That's pure gold. Yeah. We gotta have that. Jeez. We just, this is just like the Renaissance. We're like waiting for the, <laughs> some like bizarre manuscript from a monk to so yeah. run to run to Cosmo with the news. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Our own, our own little digital symposium here. But yeah, that's uh, that's good old Plathon covered, I guess. And for now, until maybe if you uh, hear any more about the translations, we could talk about that, too. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, uh, whenever the translation comes out. Yeah, I'm going to be one of the first people to absolutely jump on that and, uh, you know, get onto it as uh, fast as I can. But uh, yeah. If we're going to close, would you care if I'd done a uh, plethon prayer to the gods of learning? No, it sounds good. Perfect. So just to kind of conclude the conversation, I guess, uh, this is, uh, again, the uh, prayer to the gods of learning by plethon, in which okay. he states, Come to us, O gods of learning, whoever you may be, and whatever number you may be, ye who preside over science and the truth, who distribute them to whomever you please, according to the decrees of the almighty father of all things, King Zeus, Without your help, we would be unable to accomplish such a great work. Come guide our reasoning and grant this work to obtain the best possible success and be like the treasure always open to those people who want to lead the most beautiful and best conduct in public or private life. Excellent. Perfect. Yep. All right. All right. Thanks for having me again. I very much appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. So you can see... Uh... See your work at Temple of the Hermetic One on Facebook. I'll put a link in the video as usual. Yeah. And yeah, thanks for coming on again. That was good. Not a problem. Have a good one. Yeah, talk to you later. Bye bye. And that's it.